created by Purple Pencil Project. Uh, we are a platform to spotlight Indian literature and stories from across regions and languages. We do that through several things, book reviews, interviews, essays, even pitch books for screen adaptation. I am, of course, Prakriti Manyarit's co-founder. And uh, today I have with me Pervin Saket, um, who's award-winning novelist, poet, screenwriter, which I actually didn't know till I went to your Twitter bio. <laughs> Um, and uh, does a host of things. She's a school textbook editor. She's a literature curator and um, as well as a poetry editor and has co-founded the annual Kolam Writers Workshop. And her latest series of books, which I've been fascinated and I've been gifting to everybody I know, is the Learning to Be series for early readers by Adidev Press, which um, highlights the stories of notable Indian personalities through history. And um, welcome, Pervin. Thank you so much. I know it took a minute for us to get to this interview, but I'm so glad we made it happen. Yes, I'm very glad to be here too. Thank you, Prakriti. Thank you for having me. Let's dive straight in. I want to talk about the Learning to Be series by uh, which you've you know authored and it's been illustrated by Adi Dev Press. The breadth of the personalities you've covered in that is astonished me. There are people that I didn't know, women and men uh, across India's history. So I want to talk about the curatorial process that you uh, went through to pick whom to talk about, why to talk about them. Could you shine a little light on that? Yes, absolutely. So uh, I have to admit that uh, the idea for the series uh, did not come from me. This came from the publishers, uh, Chitwan Mittal at Adidev. She was very keen that we should uh, work on a series of books for young readers, which is oriented around um, people and history and events uh, related to India. And when she spoke to me about this, uh, I was immediately interested because as a very passionate young reader many, many, many years ago, I did not quite have uh, access to these kinds of books. And um, I did not even realize it then that there was a gap in my life. And like many of us growing up, we associate literature with something that is produced in the West. And we are simply consumers of it. Uh, we're not people who, uh, who create history. Uh, we, we, we just read about it and study it um, and passively receive it. So, uh, so I, I certainly uh, was very interested in working on a series like this. And like you mentioned, it's called the Learning to Be series. And uh, something like that, as important as it is, it can very easily become preachy and didactic. So one of the things I had in mind with the curatorial process was to make sure that the people we chose and the themes we chose were exciting, interesting, inspiring, but they were not uh, gyan giving they were not preachy. Uh, that is something that children run away from. It's certainly something I run away from. So, Absolutely. yeah. So you'll notice, for instance, one of the themes that we have is something like humor. Humor is a value. Humor with Mario Miranda. Or we have tenacity. We have passion. So I was very careful not to use the heavy-handed moralistic ideas that um, usually get uh, we inherit, uh, you know, in terms of big big values like honesty and respect and being a good person, especially being a good girl. Uh, so uh, yes, yeah, so, so that was one orientation that I had in mind that uh, this is not going to be in any way preachy or uh, have have that weight of a heavy-handed moral approach. And the other thing that I was very keen on doing, which is what we did for two sets, two box sets, was to feature women, women uh, from India who have, uh, some of whom we've heard of, but like you said, many of them have not really, they're not a part of our public imagination. And uh, it, is, it is entirely our loss. So uh, we've done a series of four books called Women in Science and uh, another series of four books called Women in Sports. And many of the people we chose are quite unconventional. 
for instance, uh, for women in sports, one of the books is about Chandra and Prakashi Tomar, who are sharpshooters, and they took up this sport when they were in their 60s. And they're uneducated women from a village um, who did this for various reasons that you'll see. But usually when we have, when we talk of a role model, we think of someone who is educated or articulate or urban. Uh, so examples like this, they, they break those expectations and they show how you can have these very powerful feminist movements even from people and places that we don't associate with. So, uh, so that was my orientation to bring about, to, to talk about people who are fascinating, who uh, may not fit those labels very easily and to not make sure that it is fun, engaging, interesting, and uh, does not have a very heavy handed approach. Which I'm so grateful for, you know, exactly what you said, that our imagination is of story as if we don't have stories that are grey, that are fun, that are, you know, they either have to be heavy handed, like you mentioned. And um, I remember we used to have these series of moral science stories and that was the only India related stuff I've read growing up. So I right. so, I'm, even the research process for this for you must have been so fascinating uh, as a writer. Oh. Absolutely. It was delightful to look up uh, all their stories and to choose the elements that we wanted to focus on. Yeah, this kind of uh, makes me think about, you've written across formats. Um, you're a poet, novelist, screenwriter, and now this book for early readers, which is supported by illustrations. So if you can, uh, you know, how do you distill from that research, from from being used to writing, maybe really um, contextualized histories, drawing in a longer narrative arc to something like this, which is very distilled yet has to be engaging, has to fit that storytelling arc. So mm. as a reader, across, as a writer of different formats, how do you grapple with the nuances of this particular craft? Each kind of craft has its own, you know, changes, uh, things you have to like take care of, things you have to get used to as a writer. So uh, speaking of you as a writer at large, how do you deal uh, or how do you work, approach work across formats? That is a very interesting question. I wish I had a very useful answer for it uh, because uh, it is it is not a, it is a process that I think about after finishing the process. Uh, rather than something that I deliberate on uh, right at the beginning. But I do know that I'm not a fan of uh, compartments and categories. So uh, the way I approach a story is uh, simply um, what is what is the, if I want to write for children, what is the best format for that particular story? Like for instance, even with these books, I we could have gone with prose. I could have written a straightforward story uh, in prose, but I chose uh, somehow poetry seemed to be the right format for this. Perhaps it is because as very young children, we uh, first encounter uh, stories in the form of nursery rhymes and songs and lullabies. And there is a quality of um, meter, rhythm, rhyme, and that that is very soothing. So, yeah. so naturally I gravitated towards that. If I, I just finished working on a poetry collection for adults. So of course, yeah. just that, that orientation is entirely different. Um, and the level of uh, complexity that I will push for in each poem uh, would be quite different. And um, yeah, so writing, writing uh, fiction is, uh, ha comes is its own uh, special journey uh, but yes recently I've worked um, on screen in screenwriting and that is in the form of an adaptation uh, so I'm, I'm I'm not able to disclose much about that project but uh, oh. that did have um, its own learning curve which was quite exciting because it was a very internal story you know a very uh, a story that is felt and a story that is deliberated upon and we have to translate that into scenes and visuals. So that came with its own uh, exciting challenges. 
yeah we're we're learning all the time with all these different it almost sounds like you were doing all of this simultaneously so i don't know how but kudos <laughs> to you <laughs> thank you thank you that, so that is the, the process of writing is actually quite messy uh, in the sense that right now like you said in the bio it all sounded so sorted that i read this and this and this and this but actually the lived experience of writing is quite messy uh, i'm doing something in the morning i'm doing something late at night that those are usually the two slots because i have a day job as well so uh, so it's it the the experience in my head is a lot more chaotic <laughs> and it's so true i mean um i think the creative mind right like the chaos is in the head but um, like good design no one can see it no one can see the chaos they can only see the final finished edited product um Absolutely. focusing a little bit more on your writing career you've written extensively in journals your work has been published across journals across um, the world and um, from having been an aspiring writer to having co-founded purple pencil project i know that submitting to journals is a very specific science or art or a mix of both i don't know what but uh, you know just want to take a step back and maybe reflect on your journey as a writer as you've grown uh, right. from those days of you know extensive uh, journal submissions and how did you navigate those early experiences early um, you know early encounters of being a writer out there putting your writing out there if you can talk a little right. about that journey as well sure sure i'm happy to uh, in fact uh, now fortunately i have the perspective of both sides of the journal since i'm now working with the bombay lit magazine as uh, their poetry editor so there are there are both these areas that uh, i have discovered uh, and initially yes uh, a new writer might find it a bit daunting to get their work uh, published in journals but some of that might be because uh, we rely on the journal selecting us rather than us selecting the journal what i mean by that is to have to to send your work to specific journals which are aligned with the kind of writing that you are doing and that you are interested in so one of the ways to filter uh, who you send your work to could be for example supposing i'm following a poet who i uh, admire and i look at their bio and the journals they are published in then i know that uh, chances are that this work will be aligned to my themes my style my ideas so uh, initially i find that writers have a very high rejection rate because they are sending it everywhere okay. so so one way to make sure that uh, you're saving your own time and heartache is uh, <laughs> is to really filter uh, who you're sending it to and that also means um, being a reader of those magazines so i would like today i'll i'll send my work to magazines that i really follow and really uh, enjoy reading myself because not only because there's a greater chance of there being a match but because there'll be a greater satisfaction for me to be featured in that so so initially writers are, might be just happy to be everywhere but then you will find that uh, you have your your dream uh, publications and presses so i don't think we should wait for that you can uh, have that idea have that filtering process in mind right from the start and establish a relationship with that journal at least one of uh, being a subscriber or being a reader and in the process you will find that you your relationship will develop into something more meaningful so that is certainly something that will help and to not visit uh, journals only during the submission periods or only <laughs> uh, to send your work but to just be a part of the larger literary landscape yeah uh, in in terms of following sharing commenting on it and uh, forming some sort of connection not because it will lead to not for any matlabi reason but because you really are interested in something that uh, they're doing and it is enriching both ways so i think that kind of approach 
of equals, of exploration, of curiosity is something that um, certainly will help uh, writers navigate this better. Yeah, it's not transactional, you know, can't be a transactional relationship between writers and um, anywhere that they're publish, getting published, whether as a novel, so with a publishing house or with a literary journal, I guess it's that, that, that relationship building. And I think not enough of us read um, when we write. <laughs> Sometimes that balancing act, um, you know, we yeah. miss. So for instance, uh, if, I, if I talk to the people who handle the web of uh, the Bombay Literature, a literary magazine, I'll find that you'll, you'll see that the most number of clicks on our website is on the submit page. <laughs> uh, and that is true for pretty much all journals. So uh, it just shows that um, we do tend to read much less than we write. Uh, yeah. And that is something to rectify. From what I've read about you, that's not a problem with you. You somehow found the time to continuously read even outside of, um, well, professional, like reading is just something you do all the time. And I, I guess all of us as writers begin as readers, right? Reading is the hub that kind of branches us into whatever, whether it be yeah. our professions as writers or other um, you know, jobs that we may do. Uh, so, you know, using that as a segue, because you also mentioned a lot about reading the magazines you submitted to. So what, uh, you know, uh, I know so many years of reading, I'm not trying to boil it down to tell me your top favorites, but just kind of reflecting on um, reading as a journey also, right? When you, as you grow up, your reading tastes change, your reading um, capacity changes, time that you can give changes. So reflecting on that a little bit and then maybe mentioning the poets and writers that have inspired you or taught you or whom you, whose work you just genuinely admire as a reader alone. If you can reflect a little bit on that. Um, sure. would love to know. Yes, that is, a, that is a pleasure. That's a delight. In fact, writing is... Uh, is a you know it's you know in uh, production and economics you hear of uh, byproducts you know which are not really the aim of the process they just happen by and by so writing is for me something of a byproduct my real passion is uh, reading it is i i tell people that i I actually wanted to make a career out of reading, but there's no such thing. It doesn't exist. <laughs> so then I had to find the, the closest, uh, um, you know, practice that is something that the world will recognize as, uh, as work uh, and allow me to quietly read. So, uh, yeah, so I've, like I, like I mentioned earlier, I grew up with a lot of uh, hunger for books. I had a lot of books around me through things like libraries, et cetera, but we could not really afford to buy books. So uh, so I spent a lot of time in lending libraries, in the school library. In fact, one of my mo uh, most touching memories today is how uh, when, when I would finish school, we had this uh, little section in the library, which was open for half an hour extra. And I could sit there and read and my dad would come and pick me up after that. And, but, but they had a policy by which you can, a student can only take issue one book at a time. So I would issue a book and start reading it. And then by the end of the half an hour, because they are these slim books, I would be almost done with it. And <laughs> that would make me very anxious because that means that I cannot issue a new book to take home. Uh, for the evening but there was this very very kind librarian and he would wait he would uh, wait for me to finish the book so that I could issue the next one so that I have something to take home and he didn't know me or uh, talk or anything of that but he just saw that hunger and he saw that somebody's interested and um, it is kindnesses like that which uh, really sustain us and which many years later you feel inspired to, to in some way, uh, pass that on to whoever else you might meet in your literary uh, encounters. So, so yeah, so I, there was a great hunger, uh, but much of what I read was written by people who were white or male or dead, 
mm-hmm. and uh, that uh, that was not something that i even consciously realized um but it it does put a bit of a it does put your put the brakes on a person who's none of these things and aspires to be a writer much later i discovered fascinating work uh in english and in translation from indian writers and so uh, I'm exactly I'm... Here, how did the discovery happen just you know curiosity because i think all of us my theory is that we all just stumble into it no one there is no conscious method to uh, and there is no rational way for us to be introduced i do not when i was also growing up i had a very similar experience as yours and it's not like there was uh, you know these books were in the bookstores visibly in the right. bookstore they, they were, were not, they would not come up in google searches i mean that's a whole different game of algorithm that you know we still only just unpacking the effects of so how i just yeah. want to know how did you come mine was in a ma classroom uh, it was a module we had uh, indian literature and translation and um, and i was just i being the nerdy person i am i said nahi translation mein kyu mujhe to hindi samajh mein aati hai to hum gulzar saab ko hindi urdu hindi slash urdu mein padhenge right. so so i stumbled into it um, so i'm very curious to know how did you find your way to indian writing yes it is quite similar actually in the sense that i did uh, do my education in literature so wow. first my bachelor's and then my masters so much of so we did have papers on indian writing and mm. uh, but but what what was very interesting was indian writing was one paper and shakespeare was one paper and they had the same weightage so well, yeah we have one writer and the same marks and then all of indian writing i know um, i that was i felt that yes. and we just like the modules right there was more american um and english uh, european british stuff than all of the other voices like african and indian combined so Correct. the <laughs> Yeah, yes, yes. yes yes but now fortunately uh, you know how life works its circle uh, i'm now on the board of studies at zavier's where i where i studied from and now i can see i can see how much the faculty and the staff are trying to change this and bring about a difference so it's very hard to so see happy. that so happy yeah. that including so writing by um the lgbtq community including uh, lots of writing that would otherwise be uh, just not within the radar of literature studies uh, all of that is now being made accessible so that's very hard that really that is beautiful that really is but i i was i cut you for on your writing journey please continue i i know i uh, yes <laughs> so no so so actually yeah it was a natural um, shift so yes that's how i was introduced to mock contemporary writing i remember in my masters this uh, text that we had by intuzake shange who wrote for colored girls who considered suicide when the rainbow was enough and uh, it just blew my mind away and uh, the the way in which she addresses race and uh, gender both um uh, so so yes th- this is the way in which gently uh, we made ourselves uh, put ourselves in these spaces but more interestingly is that you know or any of these it is a door it is an opportunity after that it is for us to push more to push further yeah. to explore and uh, you mentioned google search uh and from a completely different generation which means i did not have google or any of these things uh when i was uh, a teenager but uh today i find that for instance i ca- i can never go into a bookstore and pick up a book because they simply won't have the kind of stuff i want to read it is not the straight jacketed commercial uh fiction or non fiction that is usually available in bookstores and it is it is this very uh, it is stuff come that comes to me from recommendations from other writers uh from editors from readers and today i'm very lucky because i get to read books not only after they are published but in the process of uh, going through various drafts 
because uh, writer friends will send their stuff or uh, so so it's it's very exciting to be a part of the behind the scenes process from being this passive receiver of and uh, this hungry reader where anything will do and i really am a person who who compulsively has to read if i'm brushing my teeth i will read the ingredients on the toothpaste <laughs> If yeah. I'm stuck stuck in traffic, I will read the numbers on the various car number plates and do mental calculations of those. Now, I don't know whether other people do that, but uh, yeah, I'm always working with symbols and uh, there's a buzz. My, my head is always hot because of all the activity. So, so yeah, from that space to now see something behind the scenes and look at how um, something evolves from a very initial draft to something that's more polished and what are the considerations what are the processes it's quite it's been quite an enriching journey yeah, yeah and to grow up a reader is so special i think it's um it's just I, like you know i wish more people had access to those to libraries to books i don't think a lot of us you know like you said we all rely on the generosity of someone uh, i have I had a similar experiences and I'm not in my teens actually I'm well into I'm very very close to my 30 30th birthday but uh so I I felt the same you know I no, no, uh, I, meant, I meant historically not, I know, not I <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah no I'm just uh, I'm just yeah. joking around here but I, I get it um we had uh friends who would you know I borrow books from because we didn't have a lot of money to buy that many books, you know, we'd buy them at school fairs once in a year or twice in a year each semester. But we would not, you know, we could not hoard books as I couldn't, as touch would have the privilege to do now. Uh, but right. borrowing from friends, lending libraries, you know, that extra, we didn't have an extra hour at the library, but really someone yeah. somewhere making, breaking that rule for us because they see that we love stories. Um, in fact, it, uh, outside my house here, uh, we have, put up something called the honesty bookshelf which is this uh, bookshelf from where anybody can pick up anything they like and they can finish yeah, reading it so back cool. yeah yeah that's and children cool. i see that lots of children come uh, and they'll spend their evenings uh, sitting we've made a little bench there they'll sit there and read and it's not only that it's very heartening for me to see that even people passing by uh, residents, uh, visitors, even uh, delivery executives uh, from various apps, they will come, they'll, they'll pick up a book and go back. So it's very, it's wonderful to see uh, that kind lovely. of interview. That's lovely. Uh, that gives me an idea. I should, you know, propose it to my, the community uh, manager of my building. <laughs> um, that is lovely. But quickly to just talk, I mean, I know we're speaking about reading. I want to segue back to writing because I read this about you and it has been I have been in awe of that trick in um, one of the interviews you've mentioned how you have a writing quirk which is when you open your word document you write in writing to resist the urge of self-editing while you're writing yes which honestly it's brilliant I have <laughs> thought this for the last few hours since I read it so like why this is why have I not thought about this so far uh, mm. so I want to you know a lot of our viewers uh, are writers and readers but for the writers others mm. what are the other hacks that you have that help in the writing process because like you said it's chaotic you know people you know our minds are not as organized as our final drafts look like uh, and you have to kind of navigate weird obstacles like how do I not edit? Uh, yeah, right. So what are the other little, you know, yeah. hacks and um, DIY techniques that <laughs> you can share with our writers? Okay. Sure, let me think about this because it is true that sometimes uh, the biggest obstacle in our writing journey is our own heads. Uh, we, we need to find a way to get out of the way uh, so that the story can proceed. And I am I am trained as an editor. I've been an editor for 15 years. So it is not easy for me to switch that off uh, just because it's a first draft. Uh, because it just, it, that brain is, and, and of course, in the room, you have all the greats sitting on your shoulders when you're writing your first sentence and they're all looking and they're all analyzing. So uh, one way to switch that off is to simply not, see the text which is why uh, you 
you turn the text color into the same as the page color. But also remember to switch off your grammar and spell check. Otherwise, you'll see those squiggly lines. And, <laughs> yeah. uh, and that will, uh, you know, prompt you to go back to it. So, so more, more than thinking of it as a hack, I think of it as a way to, you know, it's, it's more of a process of recognizing what is your own obstacle. In my case, it is sure. my editing mind, which is my own obstacle. And sure. then trying to find a way to navigate that. For someone else, it might be time. For another person, uh, it might be, uh, I don't know enough about this. I don't, I've not lived this experience for an I uh, for another person it might be language uh so I remember that uh, I had a writer speaking to me who um who, who, who was unsure about uh, being absolutely perfectly fluent and grammatically correct uh with their English English was a second language for them and so we had a chat and they decided to write the story from the perspective of a person who does not speak English as a first language and is learning that language. And uh, they can bring in that particular flavor, which somebody uh, who is absolutely comfortable with it, it will be artificial for them to bring that in. So yeah. much of this is about... Uh, recognizing it's more of a mirror like recognizing what is it that stands in your way and then finding a solution to that and perhaps even turning that e exact same thing into a strength rather than seeing it as something to be fixed yeah that's a good uh, reminder for all of us to look within first rather than just borrow i think first time writers have you know um, especially because so much information is available it's a tendency to just go and look at what others are doing without first going through that process yourself and recognizing your own, um, you know, quirks and barriers that can stop you from writing continuously or progressing. Absolutely. Um, right. So instead of thinking of it as, uh, as, as hacks or DIY, it's more interesting to think of it as an introspective exercise yeah. that, will, that is specific to your process. Yeah, I love that. And I have so many things to say about that writer um, and language barrier, but <laughs> we'll save that for another conversation. Um, I just, you know, I, I want to discuss that with you. You have frozen on my screen. Okay. Um, finally, just to keep our this conversation to its, you know, uh, time limit. What are you working on right now? I know you mentioned a book of poems for adults um is you know and a couple of sc a screenwriting adaptation project um anything right. else that you're working on i know i've read i've read how you always you're always writing some ideas always a work in progress some goes in the unpublished yeah. file rightfully so lots according. of it lots yeah. of it goes in that yeah. file but yes uh -huh. i've just finished uh finished a collection of uh, poetry so that is that has been put aside uh, but I have started uh, writing a new book about, I'm not quite sure what form it will take yet, but um, it is going to be about a girl growing, a Parsi girl growing up in Bombay uh, during a very particular time period and a particular uh, social situation. So uh, let's see what shape that takes. Uh, it is very closely linked to some of the things I have seen, lived, heard. So it is a book that uh, perhaps my life has been leading towards. So quite exciting about, uh, excited about that. And of course, we have more books coming out from the uh, Learning to Be series. Yes. So yes, so much to look forward to there as well. Absolutely. I know that I'm going to connect with you about, um, you know, the upcoming books as well. But for everybody, thank you for watching. I'm going to put links of all the Learning to Be series books below. Uh, trust me, they're fun reads and they're fantastic gifts for early readers, young readers, um, you know, especially uh, Indian, um, just Indian children. I think they deserve to have more inspiration than we did. <laughs> less white, less male inspiration. So thank you so much, Pervin. This has been so wonderful. I'm so glad I got to know your full breadth and body of work through this. And uh, I'm sure readers and writers, uh, viewers have enjoyed this as much as I have. 
Thank you, Prakriti. It has been a pleasure. It was a very, very interesting conversation and I look forward to more. Thank you. Absolutely. We'll be in touch. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Check out the description below.